Welcome everybody to the Strange and Scary Mysteries of the Month. We find the creepiest true crime stories from all around the world currently going down. Lay them out here for you to check out. Thanks so much for tuning in. Here are the Strange and Scary Mysteries of the Month for November 2024. Number 5. The Lakefront Massacre A lakeside community in Washington State faced a horror show on October 21st when a brutal massacre unfolded in a home by Lake Alice. The sole survivor and witness of it all was an 11-year-old girl. When deputies arrived at the house that fateful morning, they were confronted by what they described as a significant crime scene. And five bodies were sprawled across the floors throughout. And parents, 43-year-old Mark and Sarah Humiston, who was 42, along with their children, 13-year-old Benjamin, Joshua, who was nine, and Catherine, just seven. The sole survivor, an 11-year-old sister, had managed to flee, wounded and terrified to a neighbor's home, ringing the doorbell with frantic desperation. The perpetrator was none other than her 15-year-old brother, who was taken into custody by police shortly after their arrival. But really, this story all began with a 911 call placed by the suspect himself just before 5 a.m. And he claimed in an out-of-breath and panicked voice that his brother Benjamin had killed their family before unaliving himself. Designed to divert suspicion, he then painted a picture of a brother driven to violence after being caught looking at naughty websites an alleged motive that seemed both shallow and strangely specific. But as the story unfolded, of course, the real horror came to light, and the young survivor told investigators exactly what really happened. As she described waking up in the early morning hours by gunshots, followed by the horrifying sights and sounds as she looked into the hallway. And her father, lying motionless with blood on his head, her 13-year-old brother right beside him lifeless, and then, her younger sister, Catherine, stepping into the hallway, only to be met with a fatal gunshot and her small body collapsing to the ground. The 11-year-old watched frozen in shock as her older brother then turned the gun on her. She was hit in the hand and neck, but somehow kept her composure. And she fell down to the ground in tremendous pain, but smartly played dead. And she closed her eyes, held her breath, and stayed completely still as her brother stood over her body, deciding whether to finish the job. Moments later, when she heard him leave the room and begin talking on the phone upstairs, she seized her chance. Escaping through a window, she ran barefoot and bleeding to the neighbor's house, where she managed to get help. The suspect then tried to cover his tracks, staging the scene to make it appear as though Benjamin had carried out the murders. He even used his father's silver Glock, a gun kept in the lockbox by the front door. A lockbox that, according to the survivor, only the suspect knew how to open in case he needed to protect the family. His entire attempt at deception might have actually worked had his sister not survived. And the aftermath has left the surviving family members struggling to comprehend the tragedy. As you can imagine, it, it is just a, a senseless, heartbreaking, tragic loss. How do we as a community not spin our wheels on the question of why, but move forward, uh, focusing on hope and focusing on one another? The girl is now in the care of her maternal grandmother, who has become her custodial guardian. A no-contact order prevents the suspect from having any communication with his sister, while the family home remains sealed under court orders. Number four. The pizza order that saved a life. It all started with a phone call that seemed completely out of place. 911, what is your emergency? The dispatcher answered, expecting the usual cry for help or maybe even a prank. Instead, though, they got something that sounded like a mistake. It was a woman, calm but urgent, asking, Yeah, I would like to order a pizza off the fucking heroes. Okay. At first, the dispatcher thought maybe she dialed the wrong number, but when he asked if she knew she was dialing 911, her response was clear. Yes, I'm sure I'm calling to that number. Can you get a pizza? That was the moment it all clicked. The woman wasn't confused, and she was in trouble. Real trouble. 
and ordering a pizza was the only way she could ask for help without raising suspicion. She managed to slip in enough information between her disguised words to let the dispatcher know exactly what was happening. And she was hurt, being held against her will, and needed urgent help. Her location was a field, desolate and isolated. The Lucia County Sheriff's deputies jumped into action and using cell phone tower technology, well, they traced her call, narrowing down her location where she was being held. And then the race was on to get there before it was too late. The body cam footage from the night recently released shows just how tense the rescue was. The call had come in on October 19th. In the footage, deputies arrive on scene and there he was. 27-year-old Luis Hernandez crouched over the woman. He was on top and overpowering her and the deputies made their move. The victim had fought until this very moment and now... With law enforcement bearing down on her attacker, it was clear her prayers had been answered. Get off her now. Get off her now. Give us a channel. Belusa County Sheriff Mike Chitwood later spoke about the incident. His voice carried the weight of what his deputies had witnessed. When you watch the video, he said, if you're a father or you're a grandfather, if you're a brother and you hear those screams coming from our victim, it makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. And the woman knew her attacker as well. She told deputies that she had known Hernandez and that they had come out to the area just to have a couple drinks. This was all supposed to be a casual outing. But then it was like a switch had flipped and suddenly he became violent, holding her against her will, determined to assault her. She never stopped fighting though. She kept her wits, stayed sharp and collected, and made that call that would save her life. Hernandez now faces felony charges of attempted battery, battery by strangulation, and false imprisonment. But more importantly, the woman he tried to break is alive, as she used her courage and quick thinking to turn a terrifying situation into one of survival. Number 3. Florida's Killer Clown In a state known for its bizarre headlines, few stories have been as crazy as this one from back in 1990, and recently, it got a twist. And back then, 40-year-old Marlene Warren was at home with her son and his friends when the doorbell rang. When she opened the door, standing on her front step was a clown wearing a bright orange wig, big red nose, painted face, the whole thing. They even held a few balloons and a nice bouquet of flowers Delighted, Marlene smiled and remarked, How nice. But those would be her last words because, as she reached out for the gifts, the clown pulled out a gun and shot Marlene in the face. Her son was then left to find her lying in the doorway as the killer in the clown suit made a swift escape. For years, the murder of Marlene Warren went unsolved. And there were suspicions and rumors at the center of most of them was a woman named Sheila Keene, an employee of Marlene's husband, Michael. The two of them had been having an affair, and Marlene knew about it. Are you having an affair with Sheila? No. Are you sure about that? I'm sure about that. Okay. She was planning to divorce her husband, but was worried to pull the trigger because of what he might do. She even said to her own mother that if anything were to happen to her, Michael was the one who did it. On top of that, witnesses claim to have seen Sheila behind a clown suit just days before the murder. Mothers identified her as the woman purchasing balloons, one of which read, You're the Greatest, at a nearby Publix grocery store the morning of the crime. In the getaway car, a white Chrysler convertible was found abandoned with orange fibers inside, fibers that seemingly matched the clown way. The car itself had been reported stolen, from Michael Warren's own used car lot just a month before the killing. It was all a tangled web of unconfirmed connections. So for 27 years, there was no concrete evidence to tie anyone to the crime. But eventually, Sheila Keene was arrested in 2017 when advances in DNA technology led investigators to revisit the evidence from that fateful day. A few stray human hairs found in the getaway car 
and witness statements from decades ago became key to her indictment. She had since moved on from her life in Florida, marrying none other than Michael Warren himself in 2002 and starting over in Virginia, where they ran a restaurant together. In April of 2023, Sheila Keen Warren finally pleaded guilty to second-degree murder, striking a plea deal that would see her serve a reduced sentence. Have you heard everything we've discussed, uh, Ms. Keen Warren? Do you still wish to plead guilty and have me impose a sentence as outlined in the plea agreement? Yes. With time already served since her 2017 arrest, Keen Warren was released this past month after just 18 months behind bars. Despite her guilty plea, Sheila maintains her innocence. Her lawyer, Greg Rosenfeld, insists she only took the deal to avoid the risk of spending her life behind bars if convicted at trial. The courtroom battle for Sheila's life centered on shaky DNA evidence. The one sample, Rosenfeld argued, contained both male and female genetic markers. Another could have come from one in every 20 women. And while the orange fibers may have been found in the stolen car, defense attorneys pointed out that Sheila had legitimate reasons to be inside the vehicle long before the crime took place. And after all, she worked repossessing cars for Michael himself. In the end, time became one of the prosecution's biggest obstacles. With almost three decades between the murder and Sheila's trial, key witnesses had died, memories faded, and critical pieces of evidence had been lost or compromised. It was enough to create reasonable doubt, even for prosecutors who had long believed Sheila Keen Warren was guilty. And the plea deal, while granting her freedom, left many feeling that justice had only been half served. Number two. The Halloween Disappearance of Karen Swift It was October 30th of 2011 when David Swift woke up and realized his wife Karen hadn't come home from the night before. The Swifts lived in a quiet corner of Dyersburg, Tennessee, a small town where the extraordinary rarely happened. But in their own little bubble, well, they had some serious issues they were dealing with. When Karen had filed for divorce a few weeks prior, while she had been going out more with friends and staying out later, she was 44 years old and the mother of four kids, so she never just didn't come home. Then, just a few hours later that morning, Karen's car was discovered by two hunters on a rural road, though it was abandoned and there was no sign of Karen. The scene painted an eerie picture that something bad had certainly happened when her two cell phones were found smashed and scattered along the roadside. And six agonizing weeks would pass before the tragic discovery of her body beneath a tangle of vines near a cemetery by a caretaker. Her skull had been fractured, with the cause of death being blunt force trauma with some sort of heavy object. And it was hidden underneath some, some overgrowth, suggesting that somebody, somebody must have gone out of their way to hide this Beautiful mother of four who was missing for over a month. Very disturbing details, Nancy. Under the circumstances, husband David quickly found himself in the spotlight of the investigation. With the pending divorce, tensions in the Swift home were running high. Rumors swirled about Karen even dabbling in a swingers bar, a place called the Pink Poodle Club. It was a side of Karen that many close to her had never seen before, especially David. During the investigation, it was discovered that the night before she disappeared, when Karen had attended a Halloween party and at some point had actually returned home. Her daughter Ashley called her mom to pick her up from a friend's house late that night. After getting home, they laid down together, but by morning, Karen was gone. What exactly happened from there, no one really knows, except for the killer. For years, the investigation remained stagnant, and David, despite being the prime suspect in the eyes of many, lived his life seemingly untouched by the tragedy, at least until August of 2022. And the community there was stunned when David was suddenly arrested and charged with first-degree premeditated murder. And so, what had changed? And prosecutors alleged that David had planned the murder all along, painting a picture of how he might have moved Ashley to another room 
dragged Karen to the garage and inflicted the deadly blows before dumping her body in a staged abduction. David's defense was steadfast, and there was no physical evidence of a struggle in the garage, no proof he had even left the house that night. So you actually walked around the garage and looked at it when you first went out there with Mr. Swift? Yes, sir. All right. You didn't see any blood or or the smell of strong bleach, did you? I did not. He came into the police station soon after Karen disappeared, volunteering to help however he could, actually hobbling in on crutches from a recent knee surgery. Though some pointed out that this was all part of the act, an attempt to show he couldn't have committed such a brutal crime. In May of 2024, as David faced charges for his wife's murder, he insisted on his innocence. By June, the trial had reached a dramatic climax. David was acquitted of both first-degree and second-degree murder, but the voluntary manslaughter charge lingered unresolved. The jury couldn't reach a verdict, resulting in a mistrial, another roadblock in the pursuit of truth. And since then, David has remained behind bars, awaiting a retrial on the manslaughter charge. What was it like to hear the jury say not guilty? Man, it was, it was great. I thought, finally, this is overwhelming. And to this day, the people who loved Karen remain divided. Her daughter Ashley struggled with the impossible task of wanting justice for her mom while also longing for the return of her father. Is David guilty of the crime, or did Karen perhaps get caught up with the wrong person as she attempted to move forward with her life after the separation? Well, hopefully, for all those involved, the real answers will come soon. Number 1. The Fox River Mystery March of 1979 was supposed to be an ordinary day for 19-year-old Kathy Hale. She was on her way to pick up her sister from a nearby shopping center in North Aurora, Illinois. And the journey was a short, routine errand. However, Kathy never made it to her destination. And the authorities initially treated her disappearance as a missing persons case since there was no indication of foul play. Over three weeks later, the mystery took a dark turn as Kathy's body was pulled up from the Fox River. Detective Ryan Pete, who worked for decades on this case, recently spoke at a press conference, recalling how the investigation dragged on. Leads came and went, interviews were conducted, but nothing ever seemed to fit right. After years of exhausting every potential lead, the case went cold, The name Kathy Hale slipped out of the headlines and the hope of catching her killer seemed more unlikely with every passing year. I'm just hoping she's still alive someplace. I don't care who they are, if they would just let us know where she is. And that all changed, though, in 2020. Thanks to advancements in forensic technology, Kathy's case was reopened. The authorities then connected DNA from Kathy's clothing to a name that had become synonymous with brutality in the Illinois area, Bruce Lindahl. And it wasn't the first time Lindahl's name had come up in a cold case, as he has long been a suspected serial killer, a man whose crimes left a bloody mark across Illinois before his untimely death in 1981. Lindahl was more than just a predator. He was a master manipulator and someone who appeared charming to those he met but harbored a terrifying darkness inside. He lived a total double life, hiding his twisted urges beneath an ordinary facade. And his crimes range from assaults to brutal murders, with many of his victims meeting him in seemingly innocuous settings. One of his confirmed victims was 16-year-old Pamela Moore, who was found dead in 1976. Lindahl abducted, assaulted, and murdered Pamela before callously discarding her body, believing he'd never be caught. In total, he's officially been linked to three murders, however, the actual number could be 12 or even more. Justice sometimes has a way of catching up to those who need to be punished, even if it takes decades. Lindahl himself met a gruesome end in 81 when he was attacking one of his victims in his apartment. He had gone bowling with an 18-year-old named Charles, and and they went back to his place where Bruce began to stab him. 
But Charles fought back, and in the act, Bruce had the knife blade enter his thigh, slicing his femoral artery. He then bled out right there on top of his victim. It was only years later using modern DNA technology that law enforcement began connecting the dots between Lindell and a string of victims, and that included Pamela, and now Kathy Hale. The new evidence painted a picture of what likely happened on that March day in 79. Lindell, who often frequented the shopping center where Kathy worked, had likely been watching her for some time. He abducted her from the parking lot of her apartment complex taking her to the remote area near the Fox River where her body would eventually be found. And Kathy's life was cut short by a man whose evil knew no bounds, a man who preyed on the vulnerable and left devastation in his wake. For Kathy's family, the past 45 years have been marked by pain, uncertainty, and a relentless longing for answers. And recently, a statement from them was read out loud and it said, while revisiting this case has been incredibly difficult, we are deeply grateful to finally have closure after 45 long years. Thanks to advancements in DNA technologies and groundbreaking tools, we are hopeful that other families won't have to endure the same pain and uncertainty that we faced for so many years. It doesn't save Kathy, it doesn't hold any justice for Bruce, but it's you know we're, uh, the pride that we were able to give closure to the family on this. Um, that was really important to us. So there were the strange and scary mysteries of the month for November 2024. If you enjoyed this, please remember to subscribe and hit the bell so you know when we're putting out our new content. And for even more exclusive episodes, go check us out over on Patreon. Get access to over 200 episodes. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'll see you guys in the next one.